Hello and welcome. This is Heavy Business. I'm Aaliyah. And I'm Curtis. And today we have on Naaman Snell of Space Cowboy Music. Am I correct in yep. the company name there? <laughs> yes. Um, so before we dive into our uh, detailed questions, um, would you be so kind as to give a brief summary of who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, I am a music supervisor. I work across all different medias, uh, film, television, advertising, video game marketing, uh, theatrical and streaming marketing. Uh, most of my emphasis over the last couple of years, especially through the pandemic and and through the strikes and everything, has been more in marketing in the in the areas that didn't really slow down as much. Um, but yeah, that's that's me. And what is it that you do for those markets? So my role as a music supervisor, I act kind of as the bridge between the client, my client, who, you know, typically a director or producer of whatever project I'm working on, and the studio who they're making the product for, whether it's a, a Google commercial or uh, an indie film, you know, for a, for an indie studio. Uh, and basically, my job is to facilitate the really tonally and, and message wise and everything what my client is looking to achieve, help them acquire that and be able to use it. So both creative and kind of legally is licensing uh, involved. So helping them deliver musically what they're trying to do in their project for their client, the studio. Okay, cool. Um, so this podcast is generally targeted towards people who are musicians, um, independent musicians, uh, particularly in the rock and heavy metal scenes. But um, I'm wondering how is it that you usually discover new music? Do artists reach out to you or do you just discover it through other means day to day life? I mean, really anywhere I can have access to it. I mean, I get literally hundreds of submissions a day from everybody from major labels and publishers to independent artists that I've met and formed relationships over the years, um, managers, third party pitching companies, uh, especially in marketing, we get a lot, we're contacted a lot by music libraries as well and have, you know, tons of submissions there. So, yeah, I, I get pretty much my fill of just about everything via email of my reps and, and connections every day and, and just network in general. But I'm also always trying to do things like this to meet new people and, and hear new music and find it wherever I can. Um, I still enjoy listening to the radio and seeing if some DJ, you know, surprises me with something and I wind up having to like quickly fumble my phone out of my pocket for a quick Shazam or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's really any, anywhere I can get it. Okay. So since email is one way that you find new music, how should like if an artist were to compose a pitch to you for their song, what would be the key points that would make their pitch stand out and make it like me seem relevant at all to you? It's there's a few different ways to kind of answer that question. The relevancy uh, for any music supervisor really is find out what types of projects they work on. A lot of music supervisors kind of have different niches that they find themselves in, especially in the TV and film categories. Like a lot of, a lot of music supervisors will just do dark procedural dramas because that's what they're really good at and that's what people know them for. So that's what they keep getting hired to do. Other people are really great at like, you know, YA stuff for like the CW, which has also a very specific sound and like breaking new artists and, and more pop leaning and stuff like that. So find out what, first of all, find, I'll back it up again. First of all, 
think about your catalog, what you have, what you do really, really well, and where potential uses for that would be. If it's a favorite show, like I have, like you have some dark, moody, broody covers that could be great for like a murder mystery show or film, find out what, what studio does it, go on IMDb, find out who the music supervisor is or the music department. That stuff is 99% of the time listed. And then kind of in a not creepy way, like stalk them, like figure out what they work on, how how long they've been doing certain things, try to get an idea for what they typically work on and approach it that way because then your pitch is gonna be a lot more targeted. As far as the actual email goes, again, try to be specific and like, hey, like loved your work on such and such a project. If you happen to have more stuff like that coming up, would love for you to take a listen to this. Um, I will interject really quick that uh, just a pet peeve of any music supervisor, if anybody uses the term, this song would be perfect, we will most likely delete the email. That is a that is a hot sentence for any of us. <laughs> and for whatever reason, it just turns off music supervisors immediately because you don't know what we're working on. You don't know what our client is asking us for. You know, I, I, we we understand in a lot of ways where you're coming from, what the message of that really is. But just a word of advice would be never use that phrase because I know I know some people that like that sends them into a blind rage and they will not even click your link. So there, there you go on that. Super one. good to know. Thank you for that heads up. Super good to know. Um, so what can we I'll, say and what should we say? Well, the next thing I was going to talk about as far as like this, this rabbit hole goes is the best, one of the easiest ways to get to a music supervisor in general, because we typically don't put our emails out there. You know, we try to keep that stuff pretty private because we don't want hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> emailing us every day. We'd ne we would lose our, we would easily lose our, like emails from our actual clients trying to dig through the deluge of emails every day. So my best piece of advice for getting music to a music supervisor would be get yourself a rep. That is first and foremost, find a rep because that is gonna do a lot of things for you. The rep probably already has relationships with a ton of music supervisors or people at studios or this, that, and the other. They can open a ton of doorways for you. Um, they will they will put your music in front of us and we are much more likely to engage with an email from a trusted source somebody that we know has their metadata buttoned up has their publishing and master if need be splits buttoned up i don't have like because they've already done all this pre-vetting that i then don't have to do because if some random person reaches out to me i may hear a song that i love but I've downloaded it into my iTunes and I heard it. I was working on a pitch. I go to look in the metadata and there's nothing there. I have no idea who sent me this other than there's probably an email somewhere. I'm not going to try to find it. I don't have time for that. So a rep can help you sidestep a lot of the pitfalls that can happen in the process of trying to get to a music supervisor. And again, it coming from somebody that we already know and have relationships with, whether that's because of an affiliation with a bigger group, like a major label, maybe it's on a sub label or a music production house, a music library that we have a relationship with. And we're like, oh, so and so we we know that you're buttoned up. We know what you're doing. So yeah, what we we respect your taste. What do you got? That's that's an invaluable thing to do. Any any time that I ever go to any kind of a conference and people ask me what the best way to get a hold of a music supervisor is, that's the number one answer is like get a rep. OK, so let's say an artist is an independent artist. They're not even trying to get signed to a label. They want to really do as much as they can themselves. 
mm-hmm. and hire their own people? How do they, mm-hmm. how do they go about finding a rep? There are a lot of places that will do kind of admin deals or um, non-exclusive deals. Um, there's like, I mean, there's just off the top of my head, there's like, there's pen music, P-E-N. There are, I mean, I feel like my brain is short circuiting with trying to think of like all the different people to do this. Cause there's, there's a bunch out there. Like you definitely do not need to sign to a major label um, or a major publisher or anything like that to, to do it yourself. I literally just licensed a track, finished licensing a track today where there was an independent, you know, writer who had 10% of a song. And I, and you know, there's, there's, I could go on a whole diatribe about that, which, which I very much, I I very much appreciate and enjoy. But as soon as I sent that email, I know the next email I'm going to get back is, do you have a licensing template and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, I don't. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not your rep. Well, what's the, what's the term people should Google when they're looking for this rep? What, What kind of rep is this? Um, you could do indie label, music production company, um, third party pitching company or agency, um, go down the LinkedIn rabbit hole of a bunch of that kind of stuff. Like there, there are really are like any, any number of them. And it's, it's always like a kind of a choose your own adventure when it comes to, when it comes to kind of who to hook up with and, and, you know, do at like, like I said, admin deals where you maintain control, not uh, uh, specifically of either your publishing or your master. If you're already in an agreement with somebody else, uh, there are major publishers like Cobalt that do nothing but admin deals. Um, there's also, um, like I said, non-exclusives where you can like essentially contract multiple companies to pitch your music and basically it's it's just a matter it's a way of like kind of broadening your net and your reach and basically going hey whoever brings me this sync gets the gets the commission fee you know um yeah so i had a quick question just so when someone's like looking for a rep or someone or someone like that. So what would be kind of the red flags they should be looking for? Because obviously there's a lot of scammers out there. You always hear that someone's a sync agent who isn't really, they work with Sony, they work with whoever. People get pitched us all the time. So mm-hmm. what what would you say would be the red flags people should be looking out for? Um, do your homework. First of all, ask around. Um, ask for Ask for references. Uh, that's a pretty easy one. And yeah, don't, don't give it to anybody easy or quickly. Um, you know, do, do kind of your, your research, like what, you know, what's something that you landed recently and figure out a way to like, kind of research that a little bit. Um, you know, don't, don't ever just take somebody's word for it. Of course. Um, yeah. Another one would be never sign up like never sign over your rights to anything like you especially if we're talking about non-exclusives and admin deals and stuff like that never ever ever sign anything that gives away your control of your work because that's still something that like some of the shadier people out there can try to do which is like very old school record label and publishing stuff where they'll give you a little bit of money up front, but you know, you then that is all you will ever see from that song. You know, they don't owe you anything after that. Um, and I've, you know, they, they should you again, there are millions of ways to structure any type of deal. Same with any kind of contract. Um, yeah, just never, never sign anything your control of anything away people you you can sign stuff where it's like you know never never do something where it's like we will uh we'll get something and then you know we don't need you know you are waiving your right of approval always keep your approval like artist approval is big like if they want to use your song in something they have to come to you get your permission and you sign like oh yeah that 
I fucking know toilet paper ad. I want to be involved in a toilet paper ad. Let's go. And you, you know, then you approve the rights and the fee and all that kind of stuff. And then they can go back, but never, never agree to anything where you're waiving that power of approval. And then, cause then you have no way of ever knowing if they're approving stuff on your, uh, if they're actually getting stuff for you or not and pocketing the money. You is have that no way common to though that for that to happen. That seems insane. It's it's not it's not common, but okay. again, scammers it it does happen. And Probably. again, that's that's a that's one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of like finding a like like doing your research, finding a legit rep, somebody with a track record, with a website where they showcase their work, and you know this that and the other, where you can see what they've done. Maybe in again in like the just the world network of stuff. You can check some references of like, oh, who who did you work with on this? And like, can we, you know, and just do whatever you can to get yourself into a place where you feel comfortable working with whoever you are potentially going to work with. So I had a question that we haven't really gone over. How did you kind of get involved in doing this yourself? <laughs> that is a long story, but... Nutshell the, version. <laughs> yeah, the nutshell version of that story is I kind of stumbled into it. Um, I graduated, uh, however, years ago uh, with a double major in psychology and advertising. And my aim was to get into, you know, this was back in like the height of the Mad Men craze and all that kind of stuff. And me as a young, impressionable college kid, I was like, I'm going to go be a Don Draper and work in advertising, blah. And I, I still, I love advertising. Like all that stuff is really interesting to me, but the, there are kind of two paths to get there. It's copy or it's um, like graphic design. I don't have the patience for graphic design. I just, I don't. So I went the copy route, came out to LA. It was the height of the recession. You weren't getting, you know, you weren't getting an entry level job in anything unless you already had five years of experience because that was the market. And, you know, I'd been out here for about a year. I was, you know, getting pretty, pretty discouraged. And I went out for drinks with a buddy one night and he goes, all your Midwest education bullshit aside, like, what would you want to do? And kind of kicked around some ideas. And I was like, well, I mean, like, I've been involved with and loved music since I was a little kid. Grew up with an uncle who had like a local recording studio for all kinds of local artists, like jazz primarily, but also a big like rock and whatnot contingent. And I was like, so something in music, or I mean, I love the modern storytelling of TV and film, maybe something there, maybe if there's a way to like kind of play around with both. And without missing a beat, he goes, all right, it's called a music supervisor. I don't know any, but I know so-and-so who manages this band. And like, he probably knows some people because he does a lot of work with with labels. So I'm, I'm sure we I can like set up, you know, for you to talk with him. And that just snowballed into like informational interviews for months of um, just asking people everything from music supervisors to label and publishing reps and whatnot. Like, how did you get, what do you do? How did you get into it? You know, everything that we're talking about here so far. Um, and that eventually led to me getting uh, like a, a cold call essentially from uh, this music supervisor, Eliza Richardson who has done everything from Friday Night Lights to Parenthood to more recently, like the Watchmen series, the morning show, Lovecraft Country, like some some big heavy hitter stuff. Like she's definitely one of the OG uh, pros of the business. And she kind of cold called me one day and she's like, hey, my buddy told me that you're looking for an internship. You want to start on Monday? And I was like, yeah. And then that kind of started the dominoes falling of like working with her in TV and film, worked at Lionsgate for for a minute in, in their TV department, oddly enough, like on kind of the tail end of Mad Men stuff, um, working for an ad, like a, a music house that specialized in ad agency work. Um, so getting involved in ads, um, 
And then one day I had, I was out at a mixer with a, a bunch of like coordinator level and entry level people. And I hit it off with this, uh, this girl and we got to talking and she was like, you know, I really like you. Um, I'm putting in my notice. Have you ever thought about getting into the world of like trailer supervision, like theatrical and, and streaming supervision uh, for marketing trailer supervision? And I was like, no. She goes, oh, well, if you're interested, I'm putting in my notice tomorrow and moving back to the East Coast. I'd love to be able to like give my boss your info. And I was That's like, awesome. wait, somebody who's going to pay me to do this job? Let's go. So, and yeah, I, I was at I was at that company for five years, and then in 2017, I I was I was getting the itch to well, in 2016, I was getting the itch to get back into like TV and film and then kind of working across all the different media areas that I'd worked in at the t like up till that point. And so I, I struck out on my own and started Space Cowboy Music. And, and now I work for myself and it's been great. So, Aaliyah. And that was the nutshell version. That, that's good. Um, <laughs> it was Aaliyah, great. Aaliyah, did you have a follow up before I continue on a different tangent? I... That's such a confusing way to ask that. Sorry. I have another question, but it's not specifically about that. Go ahead before I... Okay. I was going to ask you, Naaman, if you would be interested or would you be willing to share um, any exciting projects you've worked on recently? That's public information, you know, nothing secret, obviously, but... Um, and and kind of give us a picture of what that project formation looked like. Of stuff that is out, I mean, you can, the, the easiest way to do that is to uh, go to my website, um, uh, spacecowboymusic.com. Uh, I have a whole page of all my different um, stuff that we worked on and whatnot. Uh, some of the more recent stuff would be uh, the trailer for... Um, the trailer for next summer's The Fall Guy, which is Ryan Gosling and um, Emily Blunt. Uh, that was a really fun one uh, to get to use kind of kind of through a through a hay mail, hair, the blah, blah, a Hail Mary of Bon Jovi's You Give Love a Bad Name at that one. And it we're working on that thing for the better part of a year and it wound up landing. And I was like, oh, cool. Great. <laughs> Um, some, yeah, other, that's I awesome. do, I, some other stuff is I do, I do a lot of work with Epic games and Fortnite specifically. So there's, you'll see a bunch of stuff on my website of like Fortnite spots, Epic games, like general, like this is what we have coming spots. Um, oh, what would be some what other about stuff? this Fargo Fargo. Yeah, that was that was a fun one. I do. I do a fair bit with um, at the folks over at FX. And that's always a really those are always really fun projects to be on. Um, yeah, Fargo, uh, Nick Waterhouse had a really fun, you know, I oddly enough, like I've never to my to my everlasting shame, I'm told uh, I have never watched Fargo. It looks it looks hilarious and something that would be like right up my alley. I just I have I have a almost three year old. I don't watch anything. I he goes to bed and I collapse and like play video games or something because I need to turn my brain off. <laughs> but, totally. Uh, but uh, yeah, Fargo was a, was a really fun one. Um, I mean, you're gonna make me look at my website just because my brain has ceased to function. It's one of the, that's one of those questions. Like that question is like, what are some finishes you've gotten recently? That question and what are you listening to are like the surefire ways to just like short my brain out. Well, just pick one and tell and tell us the story of how how you connected on the project, how you chose the music that you chose, the kind of story behind the project is what I'm interested in hearing. Like, how do you how does your brain work and how do you make those decisions? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now to see. All right, here's one. Here's a fun one. Um, 
I did the um, the announcement piece for Microsoft's uh, acquisition of Activision, Blizzard, and King. And that was a really interesting one because I, I was contacted by a, uh, an agency that I do just a lot of work with uh, in the video game marketing specific space. And they were like, you know, at the time they were like, you know, this is the project. This is the only time we're going to tell you what the project is because it's super confidential, super NDA. It's tied up in like this, that acquisition was in, and like, I remember hearing about that acquisition like two, three years ago that they were trying to make that happen. And it was tied up in all kinds of crazy, like antitrust stuff and, and whatnot. But they were they contacted me and they're like, all right, it looks like it's finally going through. It's finally going to happen. We need to have an announcement piece ready for when this goes. And we want to like we want to make a splash with it. We want to get people talking. And I I'm a big fan of doing like what's called counterpoint, which is you do a type you you have picture that you stereotypically like what what type of music would you generally think would go on an announcement piece for something like that where you're showcasing some some big acquisition and you're just throwing a bunch of IPs in people's faces and showing off like yeah now we control Call of Duty and this and that and the other you know and and wrapping it all up in like the the bow of like we're Xbox hell yeah you would expect something with like a lot more energy and punch and like just come out of the gate swinging a bunch of swagger. And I had, I'd been holding on to this, this, um, this remix of, uh, Oh, what a beautiful morning from Oklahoma where, uh, a, uh, a really cool, uh, remixer had like, you know, redone the track into this, this big ethereal spacey you know almost like post rock meets um I, I don't know how to describe it just like just like big soaring ethereal vibes just creating a lot of expanse and space in the song and you know getting it to a place where it's like you know it's like almost room shattering wall of stone type of stuff if you listen to it as I do very, very loudly. And it's such a unique use of that track. It always kind of like stuck out in my mind. Also, like it's a it's a track from a musical. Like those get used very, very rarely. And they're always, it always kind of makes people go, oh, wait, what was that? I I know that from somewhere. That's a musical. Right. Yeah. It so kind it, of, it ticks that nostalgia, but mm -hmm. you know. And it's obviously a very widely known, even, even if even if all you know of the song is the oh what a beautiful morning, like that yeah. sticks in your it sticks in your brain uh, throughout most you know generations of of demographics of of people of audiences. Most people know that song or at least that riff. So I thought it was just a really interesting way to kind of like like i said like stick in people's minds and i pitched the idea along they wanted a bunch of like other like more expected ideas some more out of the box stuff and i threw that one in there and i kind of highlighted it for my client i was just like hey like this could be really interesting and thankfully they loved it because i mean another whole again a whole rabbit hole of like how does a song get placed conversation we could have um it it shot through approvals really fast the only the only thing that we kind of got bogged down on was it wasn't until when we started the conversation it was the whole oh money is no object go crazy and then when it came down to they selected the track it was oh wait we only have this amount of money it's like you sons of <laughs> liars liars <sighs> So, yeah, it just the the licensing process of that got a little got a little hairy. But I again, get a rep 
I had some some amazing reps on the on the publishing side that I was working with on that one that like absolutely helped me haul that mostly dead carcass across the finish line. Okay, you said this is a long rabbit trail, but can you give us a nutshell version of how does a song get placed? It really comes down to kind of what I was alluding to earlier with like, you know, knowing where your music could potentially fit as far as uses go. Like, you know, you pay, just pay attention to what brands or shows or films are what they're using and kind of approach it that way because that's kind of step one is finding finding where you're going to give your music the best shot to get placed get it to you know then it comes to the music supervisor that will go through the most kind of linear way that this works it comes to the music supervisor or or maybe the you know maybe the showrunner or the director or somebody has heard it and they really like it somebody has to like the track then it goes to we'll we'll come at it from the angle of the music supervisor again like keep it a little more linear music supervisor gets it really likes it looks for a project for it which could take who knows how long find something that they can pitch it for you know they they put it up with you know a few other options to like their client well you know we'll take the we'll take the marketing route i give it to my client typically like a producer editor team i've got to get the editor excited about it because they're the ones cutting it into the spot we have to then get the producer excited about it because they're the ones that's going to put it forward to their client at the at the agent at the you know the brand the studio whoever going to give it so then we as a team give it to the client at the studio client at the studio likes it they get it through their boss because they're usually working on somebody's team. Their boss likes it. They take it to the room of the almighty room of decision makers at like the studio again, like the studio, the agency, something, something, something. They then, let's say nobody in that in that room poo poos the idea. Then it goes to typically the filmmaker or you know I guess I'm going down like the trailer route, so we'll stick with that route. Then it goes to the filmmaker. If the filmmaker signs off on it, everybody's happy. The world sees it. Anywhere along that line, somebody can go, well, but my six-year-old daughter really likes this. Then it all gets kicked back down to the music supervisor, editor, producer team, and we have to come up with something else. That's so, especially in 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 the in the theatrical in the trailer marketing world it's a long ladder of who to get through to get a song across the finish line it's a little more streamlined in tv and film because a music supervisor in tv and film is typically working directly with the actual decision makers of the producer director that's making the film or show you get them excited about it as long as you know you're not blowing the budget or someone's able to get more money somewhere, you can, it, it winds up in the film or, or show. It, you know, for all the different media areas, there's so many different nuances of how a song gets used. As far as really all you can do as an artist, in my opinion, is focus on your music, focus on making it, the best you want it to be for whatever your aim is. If you're an artist, that's that's your your sole goal is to be an artist and tour and do this, that, and the other. Focus on that. Focus on reaching your audience, building your base, touring, getting your music out there however you can. All that kind of stuff is all part of it, but it starts with putting out good music. If you want to write specifically for sync, like there are I'm, I'm sure a ton of people that'll watch or listen to this. If your goal is to make money in sync, write that way. Find like, like again, back to pick your shots. Know what you're good at, what your sound would be good for, and write stuff that is aimed at that. Whether it's 
you know, Fortnite marketing has a very specific sound. Um, again, music for, you know, thrillers have, have a particular sound, you know, like pick again, pick your lane, know what you're good at and, and kind of follow that and, and, you know, be, be, uh, deliberate is what I'm, that's the word I was looking for. Take, like, take deliberate shots, educated, deliberate shots. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll super quick. Well, I just wanted to know, so, cause it's a, seems like a bit of a long approval process to get a song actually placed. So do you, does it ever happen where the filmmaker or the TV show or whatever, they come to you like that, I want a specific song and mm -hmm. then you have to find it. And how does that work in comparison to what you just said in reverse? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little more straightforward that way. And first sure. of all, it depends, on who's, it depends on who's asking, again, and what media and all that kind of stuff. But if the client is coming to me asking for a specific song, it's like, oh, we want to use this in this Google ad. I'm like, great. Let me let me find, you know, who who has the master, who has the publishing, make sure everybody has their splits in order. Okay, what like what rights do we need? What money do we have? Then again, go back to the labels and publishers. Okay, this is I need a quote. Uh, if I ha if I'm told the budget ahead of time, I'll always tell people like, hey, this is the this is the money I have. These are the rights I need. Can we use your song? And that's that's kind of the easiest conversation to have. It's like, do you want money or not? Yep. Uh, here, here it is. We want to do this. Um, so, well, let's just to, just to clarify one thing on this. So, like, let's say you're told by you're told by the um, production that they want a specific type of song. So is that a similar process? And it's like, I want this exact song type of thing. Like what, what, what is your role at that point? Do you then go hunt looking for different? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's where it comes in where it's like, you know, we were working on this project. We want this kind of music or okay. we like this song, but not, but we don't want to use this song. We want to use, we need stuff like it. Then it gets into the whole weeds where it's my job to be like, cool. What do we have for budget? What are the rights we're looking for? Do you want something recognizable? Do you care if it's recognizable or not? Do you like all these, this whole laundry list of questions that I need to ask the client to get that whittled down so that then I know who to go out to when I'm looking for stuff. It's like, can I go to a major label because they want Kendrick Lamar yeah. level stuff? Yeah, yeah. Or do they want Kendrick Lamar, but there's no way in hell they can afford Kendrick Lamar. They have $20,000. Yeah. I need to go to um, a yeah. company that specializes in sync music and they write stuff all day that sounds in that world of like aggressive, swaggery, attitude, fun, you know, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. You know, that that's where my my network and relationships come in of like, now I know what I'm looking for. Let me go get it. Here's a bunch of stuff. Anything tickle your fancy? Like, let's then let's go get approvals. Interesting. I was kind of wondering if it'd be a little bit more difficult because they couldn't really describe what they wanted. But it was like, I want I, I want something exciting. But it's like, what do you mean? Oh, the amount of times that I've had to tell clients fun isn't a direction. <laughs> like, what do you want? Something fun. Cool. Yeah, what is that? What does that mean? That's like, okay, so you mentioned you don't have the patience for graphic design. I'm a graphic designer. And the equivalent of that for us is, can you jazz it up a little? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. like, I, I was recently talking to somebody and, they, and one of the uh, direction that they apparently get quite often is just make it a vibe. Like, <laughs> I got a vibe. Yikes. Yeah. You got a tough job, dude. That's all I got to say on that. No, oh, 90% of our job is playing a psychologist. I'm sure. The other 10 is psychology. Well, at least you got that degree too, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm well prepared.
<laughs> so I know we're running out of time, but I do have one other thing I wanted to just cover briefly. Sure. Just wrap us wrap us up, Curtis. Oh, I got, I got the wrap up question. Bring it home. Ooh, now, now I'm under pressure here. Um, well, basically, what I wanted wanted to find out is like, okay, so you said there's not a lot of hard rock and metal that get placements. You said that's a pretty tough. So can you give some examples maybe of like how a rock or a hard rock or metal artist could break into uh, this area instead of like that, just that they can't, because if it's happened, it's happened. Right. So there has to be a way. So in, in your mind, what would be the best advice you could you give someone in our audience of how to break into film, video game, all the rest of it. Again, I think it's I think it's about just paying attention to how that type of music is being used and where it's being used. TV and film, I think there's a little more wiggle room there because there's always scenes. Fair. Like there's there's so many different types of scenes where rock, metal, something could be used. Um in marketing, it is admittedly much harder, especially for metal or heavier rock. Um, but by the same token, um, you know, turnstile was just used in a Taco Bell campaign. That's right. That's um, right. You know, um, I don't know why this came to mind, but Secret Life of Pets, there was a there was a a trailer where at the end of the trailer, there's a poodle that when their master leaves, you know, their super expensive penthouse mm -hmm. in New York, the poodle hits the radio and it's, you know, death metal. Oh. And, you know, that's, it was hilarious and awesome and a great, and a great little moment. The opportunities are out there in marketing. It's just much more limited my advice would be if you are targeting marketing specifically, again, listen to how that type of music is being used in marketing, where it's being used, and what can you do to your sound if, again, you are targeting something like that to make it more friendly to a use like that. Like swag rock is a, still a big thing, but the era of like the stomp clap is like fading a little bit. Like there will always be the stomp clap. If you're a stomp clap artist, don't worry. That's never fully going away. Much like covers is never going away. But what can you do to harness a similar type of attitude and energy for that is, that is you always needed in promotional marketing, whether it's ads trailers, streaming, whatever, video games. And how can you kind of emulate that, but make it your own and make it palatable to a brand? Um, I mean, I, I'm working on a project right now where a reference was make it, make it, make it Mad Max, Mad Max meets Queens of the Stone Age. And I'm like, cool. I know people that can do that. So I, I reached out to somebody and had had something created. Um, so, you know, there there are definitely avenues. You just it it admittedly is going to be a little trickier to find them if you're trying to stay like pure, like hard rock metal with it. But if you can adapt and and manipulate what you're trying to do again, purely in the service of getting sync. Again, educated, um, deliberate shots. Is it worth it to do that in your opinion for the artist? It depends on what the goal of the artist is. Like, I mean, sync, <laughs> sync is an absolute crapshoot. But, um, you know, just because, again, from the, the different layers of approvals that I was talking about earlier, like, I, I know people that are very talented artists that have like been going at it for a long time who don't do all that well it's in sync but they find other avenues like you know speaking of video games like composition like you know scoring a video game maybe there's an avenue there 
Um, I mean, look at like cyberpunk and like different racing games, which tend to use a little, little heavier stuff um, or fighting games, you know, again, there, again, there's, there are avenues. You just have to be able to, you know, figure out where they are and pay attention to what they're, what they're already doing and how you can fit into that, that area and then go find the people that are making that happen via, you know, LinkedIn, IMDb, you know, what have you. It's, it's back to your original question. Yeah. It's, it's worth it if that's what you want to do, you know, but you, you can't, you, it's one of those things you can't, you kind of can't half asset. You have to whole asset. So quick, quick follow up to that. And maybe you can't give us maybe a ballpark estimate. Like if you're selling your soul for commercial success here, what is the ballpark range of a sync licensing for a single placement that you've seen like on average? It, I mean, it really depends on what it really just, it depends on, it depends on what the, what the project is. I mean, in What's the lowest budget you've had to find a sync license for? $250. Really? Yeah. Sorry, the, the lowest is actually gratis. Fair. I, fair. Yeah. I've, had totally, do, yeah. I've had to do gratis licenses before. Well, wait, 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 wait. I know the, two, the 250 minutes. was like it was that's that's a little dramatic. That was for like a uh, um that was basically like coming out of somebody's pocket and they were trying to like promote like an indie thing that they were doing and blah, blah. Um, I would say on average, the kind of stuff that I see for marketing, I mean, it can go as low as like, you know, library fees or like 500 to a couple thousand um, on up to you know, I'll, I'll do kind of like more indie level, indie level stuff where it's like, we want, you know, we, we don't want library music. We want like a, like a sync song, you know, we don't necessarily want a big artist song, but we want a sync song, but all we have is $10,000 up to, you know, there, there's different, like, I would, I would say a lot of like brand stuff that I'm seeing, you know, if it's not like a big name artist, it's, in the like 20 to 50 range, maybe somewhere in there. And then, I mean, once you, you know, get in, once you get kind of above that, you're, you're getting into like the, you know, 50 to a hundred and, and that area is kind of like, you know, maybe sync artists who have had a lot of success in sync and they, they kind of, they're, they've tapped into a sound that is very desirable and they have like a pedigree to back it up of sync. And they're like, yeah, if you want like my new track, it's, you know, it's 40,000 aside. So $80,000, um, you know, and you'll see stuff kind of swirling around in that ballpark. And then anything like over a hundred, that's where you're getting into like, they want something with some street cred. They want something that people are going to recognize you know, it's so like a famous artist type thing. Yeah. Some, some level of recognizability. And then the, the money goes up exponentially from there based on the, the level of the song, the level of the artist. you know, all that, the name recognition, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, the sky, the sky is the limit on, on that end of things. I had one quick final, 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 final question, final question, I hope. Um, how often is it that you get asked to, or they, they have to get artists to do freebies then just to get into sync? Is that common then? It's not very common. Okay. Like most music supervisors will kind of draw a line of like, Hey, music's not free. Like you gotta okay. get into something. Yeah. Like, I was gr curious. Gratis, gratis stuff will usually happen if it's like, I mean, at least in my experience, if it's like in in film for like a super indie where they're literally like we yeah. have zero dollars that makes sense yeah 
like we like your song would you like like at least for festival rights would you let us yeah. like use your song and then if we if, if the film sells and we have a budget we can renegotiate blah 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 that makes there's sense stuff, there's stuff like that or if it's like for like a cause or something where it's like it's it's for an or like a small organization we're trying to you know do something for you know save the kittens or something yeah it's like, can can you let us use your song to save the kittens? But like Microsoft isn't usually going to come up and say, give me a free song and for exposure or something like that type of thing. No. Okay. Cool. No. In, in, a, in a lot of ways, the, the, the mentality has kind of gone away of like, oh, it's a privilege for us to use your. <laughs> That's your what I was wondering. Yeah. Our thing yeah, because, yeah. you know, it's going to blow your career up and it's like, Eh, but have, have you seen what people have been able to do with SoundCloud and social exactly. TikTok yeah. and you know, we, yeah. we don't need your exposure anymore. Okay. That was what I was mainly curious about. So like, well, it never hurts, yeah. but the argument of like, we're going to make your career is a little, it, it's a little watered down. Cool. I think I have asked my final, final, final question now. I'm sorry. Well, well, no apologies because we actually need to wrap things up. Yep. Thank you so much, Naaman, for coming on here. I think we've got so much interesting information. Um, so, yes, thanks for coming on here. And everyone oh, listening, thank you for listening. And until next time, make like a bull and throw those horns up.